My name is James and I paint minis. This is Spoon 37 Minis. So, making chains requires some tools that are a little bit unusual for uh, the normal tabletop wargaming hobby. So you can start with your hobby clippers. These will work perfectly well for wire provided they cut flush on one side as I've discussed in earlier videos about assembling miniatures. But then you're also going to need some specialist jewellery pliers. So I have this rather fetching pink plier set which includes a round nose set of pliers, flat nose set of pliers, and the needle nose or snipe nose pliers. You'll also need something to clean the wire with abrasively. I've got a small piece of scotch bright pad. This is a gray extra fine pad. Um, you can use extra fine steel wool as well. Either works, you just need to go over the wire to abrasively clean it in case there's any release agent from the factory and then obviously you're going to need some wire so as an example some half millimeter copper wire I've got all kinds of sizes in here and for the purposes of making chains we're also going to need a form so I have here a piece of um, coat hanger wire it's about two millimeters across but the point is that you wrap the wire around this in order to make a series of rings right now because the chains that I make for models are extremely small in order to see what I'm doing I'm actually going to start off making some gigantic chain links so you can see the process so instead of the very fine wire I showed a few moments ago I'm going to use this very thick two millimeter wire just as thick as the uh, coat hanger wire but in order to make it a big ring I'm actually going to wrap it around an aluminium bar which is about half an inch or 12 millimeters across. So this will make a really gigantic ring so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, so to begin, first you have to free up some wire. This is quite malleable, even though this is very, very thick wire. Being copper, it's extremely soft. You have to make sure that the tip is actually flush cut. I don't know how well you can see that, but if it has a point, you just nip the point off with your ordinary hobby pliers. Now, before you can do anything, it needs to be abrasively cleaned. Now, this is where your Scotch-Brite pad comes in. You straighten this as best you can. Get your Scotch-Brite pad and just squeeze it and run it along the length of the wire. Do this a few times pretty much until it's just shiny and then you have a length of wire that's ready to go. This might make it a little bit warm. Once you're ready, you can measure a length. I'm not going to bother because this is just for the purpose of demonstration. Take your hobby clippers, cut it so that it's flush on the side you're going to be working with and that will leave a flush cut this side and a point on this side. If you want to be safe when putting this away, you can then turn the pliers round and nip the point off. And that way it's nice and safe for you to put away. Right, now to turn that into chain, you need your form and your wire. Now, as this is copper and it's soft, you can actually just use your fingers to wrap the one around the other. Now this is extremely thick, very stiff wire compared to what you would normally be working with. So if this seems a little awkward or a little difficult, it's simply due to the excessive thickness of the wire and not that I've chosen a poor material or anything like that. But trust me on this, this copper is just about the softest material you could possibly hope to work with. <clears throat> now, that gives you a short coil. You can use pliers to completely flatten this out if you want to, 
um, but you don't have to because you're going to cut these ends off at some point and no amount of squashing that with pliers will actually make it completely round so generally they have to be cut off anyway but you can see that that will give you several hoops now to turn this into chain you have to cut the individual links so you take your flush cutters I hope these are up to this thick material and you nip that off discard the excess you then come along and you do the next one trying not to cut into the next ring across and that gives you one ring you repeat this pattern I'm only going to do a few links obviously for this large demonstration but if you're making a chain for a miniature you're probably going to want a minimum of about 20 of these rings this will produce four and that's it now the reason I'm doing this at this very very big size is it should be easier to see that there's actually a flat point or flat end there and then there's a pointed side over here now to make that right before we can actually construct the chain we have to cut this point off otherwise you're going to have sharp points all over the place and you may actually cut yourself even though this is a soft wire if you'd made this out of a harder wire like steel it would be even sharper and even more likely to cut you so you just get the flush cutters and as close to the end as you can you just nip off that point and then that little bit goes in the trash and then you've got two reasonable flat surfaces now you can probably see because this was part of a coil they don't actually line up very well now you could manipulate this with your thumbs at this large size but I showed you the pliers earlier they actually serve a purpose the idea here is that you use the pliers to manipulate this ring so that they end up roughly level and then you can squeeze them a little this is at the limit of the size for these pliers so bear with me and you can squeeze them until they actually start to look like just a continuously round ring there we go now that gives you one link now it shouldn't take a genius to work out that if you can make one link you can make several links and join them together joining them together is just a question of having several links like these and then using the pliers to twist them open and put them together I'll show you that step next
Right, with the four rings pretty much closed up, they might not be perfectly sealed, but you still need to work them a little bit. You need to twist them open in order to link them together as chain links. So you get your pliers, you twist until the ring opens. You then generally put two rings through that, and then you close it. Now this isn't rocket science, but at the smaller size, it does get extremely fiddly. That produces a very simple chain from round links. Obviously I only have one more link to show you. You can use your fingers if, they're, if the links are large enough. And then you can add that, and then we have a chain made of four round links. So that's the principle. The only thing is, if I show you next to a miniature, that chain is rather large for miniatures. Now, I made it this large for the purpose of demonstration, so let's make a smaller one. So for the finer chain, I'm actually going to use a wire that is between half and a full millimeter. I'm not sure you can read the label, but it says 22SWG, that's the British standard wire gauge, 0.71 millimeters across bare copper wire. Now this, as you will see compared to the previous wire, which was these, is very, very, very much thinner. So for this, the principle is exactly the same actually. Being thinner, it's a lot easier to work with. I'm gonna get slightly more of it, but the principle is exactly the same. So you take your scotch pipe pad and you pull the wire through. Obviously, if there's any kinks from how it's been stored, that will be a little bit more difficult to draw through, but then that is part of the reason for doing this. It removes release agent and it smooths out the kinks. Now, of course, if there are still any kinks left, you can either go over it harder, or, if you prefer, you can try and flatten them out with pliers, which is just a case of manipulating it until it looks more straight. Now, once you're happy with the wire that you've got, you only want to cut away the bit that is already uh, abrasively cleaned, and just as before, you flush cut, the end, make sure this end isn't sharp, it actually is sharp, so I'll flush cut that as well. And then to be safe, I can put that to one side and flush cut this end so that that can go away nice and safely. Now, with these i found there's a trick to making sure it doesn't all uncoil at once. It's not quite enough. So we can wrap it around pull that through and fold it over and then it can't uncoil so it can go back in the bottom. Okay so that gives us this uh, very thin length of wire. Now to turn it into links just as before we need a form. Now we're not going to use this great big thick form that we used before. We're going to use our coat hanger wire which is very much thinner. It's about two millimeters across it will produce a ring of approximately two millimeters because although you actually um, wrap it around this and it's obviously bigger once you've cut away the points you actually end up with a ring about this size so to just start it off you just squash it you can see this around the form and then you keep it at one end and then generally you steady it with one hand and you coil it with the other now Hopefully you can see this. You will find that your rings will spread out if you're not too careful, but it's so soft you can just push them together. If you don't do this pushing together bit, you'll actually end up with rings that are a slightly uneven size. Now, obviously for something like industrial chains, for a dungeon or something like that, I imagine the links would be fairly consistent. You know, you wouldn't necessarily have you know, a big link followed by a small link, and so on. So obviously this form and keeping a nice tight coil will ensure that you end up with nice uniform rings. Now, 
you keep doing this and you can keep pushing it along along the form until you reach the end of the wire and then what you'll gradually find is as you run out of wire it becomes slightly harder to coil with your fingers now with the thick wire before it was so thick I couldn't actually squash those ends down but this is thin enough that if I use the flat pliers hopefully you can see I can gradually just pinch it round and it will fold over now the very end of that is actually slightly more straight than I would like so I, invariably I'll cut that off but then to do the remainder of the coil all of the rest of the form is kind of in the way so instead we simply slide it along which is the advantage of having a nice round form by the way and then you get it to the end so again you can just coil it around and around and around making sure if it does start to wander off you just squash it together and keep coiling it tightly until you run out of wire and then you can squash the ends again. Now just whilst we're on the subject of a round form, I have noticed if you get a book on the subject of making jewellery out of wire, it will actually instruct you to use the round nose pliers to make rings. Now as you can see they are tapered. I'm a bit puzzled by this because that will guarantee that if you make 10 rings you'll end up with at least 9 different sizes because there's no guarantee you'll hit exactly the same point of those tapered round pliers every single time whereas at least if your form is round and roughly the same diameter all the way it stands a chance that your rings will all be the same size so speaking of rings the same size having got to the end of that hopefully you can see again I can squash that down and that should give you a nice coil of wire and then you should oh, that end slightly bent I'll, I'll push it to the other end and then uh, it should come off nice and easily and the stresses in it will cause it to diverge slightly but that's simply because you've put so much energy through it but that should give you a nice coil which you again can cut through with your clippers to make a series of rings we'll do that next So as before, we need to cut the individual rings off the coil. So we start by nipping the end off. Leave it a bit left over, it falls on the disc. And then we just snip off one ring at a time. And obviously these are very much smaller, so it's very easy to nip two or even three at a time but the idea is just to get each individual ring off i think for the purpose of this video i'll just cut four or five rather than all of them and then we'll have enough for a brief demonstration of how to make a chain so yeah that'll do so as you can see I've got a few small rings now as before each one has a flush side and a pointed side so the trick is to flip the cutters around and cut off the pointed side now this is a bit harder to see and of course that's gone flying on the floor but that's your starter link and once you've cut them all like that, you can start making your chain. So let's do that. Trying to put the excess in a little tub. Um, but it's not always easy.
Right, there we go. That's actually seven links cut out. Now, same principle as before. You use your two pliers, but now, of course, each individual ring is a lot smaller. So it's very much more difficult just to get the pliers on. And of course, if you're not very, very careful, you can actually end up crushing this ring. You might, for example, end up with an egg-shaped ring Or you might simply squash it so it's not round in the slightest bit, but that's okay, that's the kind of thing we're aiming for. And then we just go along. And what I usually do, to be honest with you, is I actually do half of them roughly, so <clears throat> probably four in this case, as I have seven. And I'll have those as closed rings, and then I'll use rings that I'm, I need to manipulate anyway as the linking rings and do it in situ. You'll see what I mean in a moment. So that's going okay, and then we'll do this as the fourth one, and then you'll see what I mean. So that gets twisted, flat, and then squash, squash. And then you've got your ring pretty much ready to go. Now, for the linking rings, same sort of idea, because I want to make sure that they're round so I still have to squash them into position, but I don't put them on the desk, I immediately twist them open again. And then, same as before, we put two rings on that. This is a little bit fiddly, so bear with me. Ooh, dropping it. Try again, right there we go, one, two, and then we just have to carefully grip the other side and twist it closed, and then we can check to make sure it's actually closing properly with the pliers in situ with the other two rings going through it. Now, as you'll obviously work out, I've got two more closed rings. And I can take one of the as yet unmade rings, or unfinished rings, and I can do the same again, and then I'll have two short runs that I can link together with the final ring. And that's generally how I go when I'm making these chains. It might seem fiddly, it might seem tedious, but actually it goes together fairly quickly. But because of the small size, you may actually find this produces a shorter chain than you expect. So that's another one of three, one, two runs of three, and then those can be linked together by this final chain. There we go. And now there's a tricky bit, making sure you get the ring on the end of the previous chain. Get the one in the middle it looks wrong and then we try not to drop that on the floor and get again the end and then carefully this is where you can screw it all up and drop it all and say a lot of rude words but if you do it just right finish that off and you should if i can just find the end there we go, you should have a short length of chain, considerably smaller than the previous one, as you can see. And then, if you can make that much chain, well, you can make a much longer chain from the remaining links. Now, thanks to a bit of camera trickery, I can show you finishing a longer chain using the bit we made earlier plus all of the rings I cut out earlier which turned out to be an additional 54 rings which I have already made into a long chain to attach to the original 7 that I showed you I decided not to show you cutting out each and every single ring because it's literally just 54 more of the same 7 you saw earlier so if we take this 7 that you saw that makes it eight 
And then another 53 rings already in a chain. There we go. We actually now have 61 rings in a chain. And it's actually starting to look like a chain. Imagine that. Now if this cooperates for two seconds, I can pick it up by the end. Right, there we go. That's your chain, which is now, believe it or not, considerably longer than the big one we made earlier. And much more importantly than that, it's much more in proportion with the kind of tabletop miniatures that we use. So you could imagine that being either about the person, there is actually a bit of chain here which is a similar size or it could be used on a piece of terrain or a diorama which was actually my idea I, I was making a little dungeon and I wanted someone sort of chained to the wall so I had chains that were about this long and then there's a skeleton on the floor with some little manacles around your wrists and there you go obviously his fate was a bit grim but there you go that's how you make the actual chains themselves out of copper wire. Now, of course, you don't have to use copper. You can use, for example, brass wire. I also have a small amount of black iron wire and I have some stainless steel wire that they are harder to work with. As you get more into it, you get more used to working with wire and the harder to work with wires become a bit more accessible. Now, just before I finish this video, just a word on forms. You will notice that I've used precisely round forms. Now, you could use two of these side by side to make an oval, or you could have actually something, if you find something or make something which actually has an oval section, that would work as well. What you'll notice I've not used is anything square or rectangular or diamond shaped in section. This is because in order to get the coil of wire off, it actually has to be able to rotate around to actually slightly loosen the coil so that it can come off the form. If you have one that has corners, it can't twist unless somehow the form underneath can also twist because the corners prevent it from doing so. So if you wrap it tightly around a square edged or rectangular or diamond shaped form, you can actually get the coil completely stuck and then you're in trouble because you can't free the coil from the form and then you kind of either have to cut into the form or find some other way of deforming the the coil of wire to actually free it from the form. So you may think this is extremely limiting to only use round or oval shapes but with a little bit of experimentation you can actually make quite realistic looking small chains. Uh, any size you like provided you've got a form to suit. If you do have to make square sections you rely on the either the needle nose plier or if it's really big the flat nose pliers just to bend the wire with these so that you've actually got that sort of flat 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 and then snip it with the pliers so that you've got you know the, the sort of what would it be, diamond shape or rectangle or, or what have you, um, in order to make a, a chain that is square or some other ornamental shape, you'd have to make those individually, I think. Right, if you watched this far, first of all, thank you for watching. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. If you liked it, please hit like, hit subscribe, hit the little bell-shaped icon so you can get notifications about future videos. I hope they will be coming out soon.